Okay, hello everyone, thank you for coming. I'm Marie Dory, the branch treasurer here in the JCU, and I sort of follow the pensions thing, even though I'm not officially the pension officer. It's my great pleasure to welcome Jane Hutton to talk to us today. She's a professor of statistics at Warwick University, but she's going to talk to us today in her capacity as having recently been, well, I'd call it deposed, <laughs> from a position as a UCU appointed trustee. Um, on the Board of Trustees for the University Superannuation Scheme, the pension scheme to which so many of us belong. She's going to talk about things she's learned about uh, pensions and how they're organized here. And Thank you. Sure. Yeah, there's some irony in this in that my dad was, uh, was a consulting actuary, so I did consider the career and decided it wasn't for me. And then all these years later, I'm ended up learning much more about pensions than I ever know. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start, because I know it's a mixed audience, I'm going to start with the basics of pensions, very basic. I'm going to talk through a number of points which get more and more directly related to USS to give you some idea of the kinds of points that were picked up by the Joint Experts Panel report. Um, some of you might also have seen, seen me looking up the all-party parliamentary groups, parliamentary groups on whistleblowing, because they've got a report, which I might quote one or two items from, because I have um, tried to get the pension regulator over a year now since the pension regulator was asked to follow up. So I sent an email on the 5th of November saying, I haven't heard from you since the 13th of September. Here are some simple questions. And a week later, because I've forgotten to do this, I said, can you please acknowledge my email? I had said, please let me know when you'll reply. So uh, the pensions regulator said, um, oh, sorry, I forgot to acknowledge your email. I'll try to reply by the 20th of November. I mean, clearly questions like, have you seen this report yet? Take at least two weeks to answer. Questions like, are directors who are professionally qualified expected to use those professional qualifications? Obviously it's going to take you two weeks to answer because the answer is on the government website. So, lots of us took our pensions for granted until um, people started playing silly games. What's the idea of a pension, right? The basic idea of a pension is, so this is all toys, forget inflation, forget anything else to start with. The basic idea of a pension is you start working age 20, you stop working age 60, you live for 20 years. And so you've got an income of 30k, large number, for 40 years, and then you've got nothing. At which point you might go, uh, maybe I should spread it out a bit. Okay. So the origin of the pensions we used to have, which were 180th, were actually essentially based on the idea of 40 years working, about 20 years life expectancy, and the idea that it's not as expensive uh, to be retired as to be working. So certainly if you look at mathematician stress styles, that probably doesn't apply. But if you look at um, some other professions, they probably spend quite a lot on working and commuting. Okay, so what are we thinking about in terms of pension, and what about the words have been behind all the, the discussions in the USS debate? So DB, and I will probably just keep using the initials because they're so familiar now, defined benefit plan. In other words, there's a set monthly amount on retirement. Okay, modulo up income, you know, updates for inflation, but you are told this is what you will get on retirement. There is a formula, we can work it out. A defined contribution plan is something where it says, right, you will have such and such amount deducted from your salary, and your employer will pay such and such, and it will go into a pot. And when you retire, you have it. And we don't want to see you ever again. Now, what we had typically in this country, South Africa as well, I think, but not so much in, in mainland Europe, was a final salary defined benefit plan. 
and that was under which an employee receives a set monthly amount upon retirement, depending on the years of service and your highest salary. So the years of service meant you got that 180th credit each year you worked within USS or BT or wherever you worked. And the final salary was very rarely literally your final salary. It was usually average over three, five, ten years. USS was rather interesting because actually it wasn't actually average over the last years. They sort of went back, did a flation adjustment, and bumped it to the highest. So I, when I started in my first year, there was a pay rise of 23% just because of where we hit. Somebody who had retired at that point would have actually got the benefit of that upgrade. So that's, that's basically what they were doing. It's typically called Care Career Average Defined Benefit Plan. You're getting a set monthly amount of retirement, which will depend on your years of service, and it will depend on your salary each year. So the difference is it's not only your salary in your last three, five, or ten years, it's your entire progression. That's what came in in 2011 for our uh, younger colleagues, the newer colleagues, and of course in 2016, um, we have the um, end of the final salary, um, which um, there was a certain amount of debate about whether you could have said final salary ought to be the, your final salary or the salary at that year. It was decided we couldn't argue about that. As I said, the final contribution plan, money's going in, and you get to the end. So what I'm going to do now is give you another couple of toy examples so that you can start to think a little bit more about those things and what's, what's fair about it and what the appeal might be for certain people. Um, so the, the underlying toy in low inflation is I'm used to talking to mathematicians and they'll leap in, in and tell me I'm being silly before I even start. So yes, this is pretty caricature at the moment. But let's take one of the things that um, I first uh, tried to get information about as a non-executive director. Directors are legally entitled to see all the documents of the company. And that was to do with salary cards, because um, there was some work done, uh, three quarters of a million paid to McKinsey, uh, without mentioning it to the board, uh, to do some future planning. And one of the future planning things they did, you know, was about how much pension people would have. And of course, reading through this, it said, we assume linear salary progression. So here we have some salary parts, um, starting age 25 at a salary of 25, um, and the blue one is the thing that McKinsey was using. You start 25 on 25, you finish at 65 and 65, and you just draw a straight line through. And that's what it is assumed, you know, in some calculations. Now the black line is much more typical, and the black line explains part of the reason the final salary got into trouble. The black line is the kind of thing I saw when I joined as an academic in 1986, in that most of my older colleagues got to senior lecturer and they stayed there. So they might have got there within 10, 15 years, and then essentially their salary was level apart from inflation. Of course, what we also had which has caused some problems for final pension schemes was the red type of line, where you get somebody who gets a certain distance, and I'm not sure how many of you I might attend at some point, gets a certain distance, trundles along, and then suddenly thinks, I could go into university administration. <laughs> I could become a vice chancellor. You know, my name's Glennis. Whee! Um, now, of course, if you start thinking about what that does to your contributions and your pension, that's quite important, which is what I want to talk about. So, let's imagine we're still at a defined benefit, 50% of your final salary, and we're just taking all these people as contributing the whole 40 years, right? Simple case. Well, what's the pension going to be? The, the, the old-fashioned person on the, you reach the top, 
and stay along it, the black trajectory, well, whether you average over the last three years or the last ten years makes no difference. They get the same pension. If you go over the career average, you're dropping that pension a little bit, but notice, not all that much. However, if you take the blue person, averaging over the last three years gives you 32k pension. The career average is 22 and a half. So that's a pretty big difference. Even the 10-year average is giving you reasonable size difference. And then, of course, if we take our red individual, well, lovely, 45,000 or possibly more. If somebody decides to give you even more in your last year. Uh, last 10 years, you're back pretty much to your bog standard person. And a career value is lower than that standard, you know, about 26k. Now, why does that matter? Well, we also have to think how much of these people put in if they're putting in fixed percentages. And I've, I've got a graph of this. But essentially, one way you can think about it is you could say, this is how much at a 25% contribution, because I've chosen to use that. Imagine, and I'm not worrying employer, employee, anything, just imagine a quarter of the salary goes into a pension fund. Well, that means that the person on the black trajectory has got over 600 million, uh, 600,000. The blue has got 461, and the red's got 530. Okay, the red's put in more. But then we can ask the question again, just as a simple way of thinking about it. Imagine you have that 600,000 pounds, and every year you took your set amount out. So 611 to 50 pounds, every year I'm taking 32,500 out of it, no inflation, no nothing. What happens? Well, the, there's enough money in those savings for 18.8 years for the black. So you can see that's quite near the 20, the old style thing. On the other hand, your blue salary, that assumption, it's only about 14 and a half years. And of course, if you've got the red salary, it's only about 12. In other words, this is the kind of picture we're looking at. Now, of course, if this is nearer to what's really happening, and you estimate your pension liabilities on that, you're going to estimate your liabilities to be bigger than they are. Depending on how you estimate your assets, you're going to be overestimating a deficit. So when I heard this, that that trajectory is being used, it was like, I think not. Can I have a sensitivity analysis, please? So, okay, I'm a statistician. I'm a medical statistician. We do cynical things like people say, my new treatment works. And you say, this is it. Um, and how many patients did you exclude before evaluating success? I, I, I literally have done this for the work on epilepsy. Um, the clinicians are saying, why are the results published from case theory so much better than the clinical trial? So we got a graph, looked at it in detail, the Italians published a lot, and you would find they would start off with 73 patients, and they would report, report the results on 31 of them, and you go, uh, if we put those patients back at, you know, sensitivity analysis, my published meta-analysis on epilepsy, put in best case, worst case scenario. So I said, give me a sensitivity analysis. This was one report, by the way, where the entire board said this report is useless. Go away and do something from it. So as a sensitivity analysis, I'm making this up and I've got to remember exactly. So the original thing was, you know, based on somebody on about the middle stream, from age about 40, linear salary, and it came up with this is how much a person would expect to have of DB, DC, and state pension. The sensitivity analysis took people aged 35 and 45, not 40, and they presented the total pension as including an estimate of private savings. They said, look, it doesn't make much difference. Right? They didn't let, tell me what comments so they've done. Of course, what they forgot is if you put state pension in, right, that's a fixed amount. So I could back calculate that it made a difference of about maybe 17%. But when I said, what formula have you now used for the salary? They, they, they came back to, oh, this is um, um, one of our more complicated spreadsheets. Um, um, 
um, uh, we might have to let you see that or, or, or give you the mathematical formulae. Yes, well, of course, as a professor of mathematical <laughs> science. So I pointed out what they should be giving me is the mathematical formulae and the, and the program and how they verify their program correctly. Did you know that all the accountancy companies I've had dealing with say, oh, well, of course, spelled spreadsheets all have mistakes in them. <laughs> and I'm going, what's funny about that? You don't get away with that with medicines regulation. Why is it funny if 23% of the salaries and evaluation have to be approximated because you're not quite sure what's happening? I did say 23%, not 3%. So, well, what happens if we now think about deficit recovery contributions and our estimates? And salary cap. Okay, so we've now got a salary cap, money below all goes into pension and, and the running costs. Money above, well, only part of that goes into defined contribution, but a large whack of it goes into filling in the, the alleged hole. As I put in a cap of 55,000, just convenience, simplicity, what's happening to money above the cap? So, below the cap, I'm still thinking, okay, a quarter of it goes into DV pension <coughs> and above. 15% goes into your personal pot, but 10% goes to pay the debt. Okay, so who contributes what? It doesn't matter whether you get the right salary part. Okay, so the dotted lines now are, that's, that's the blue salary, that's the black salary, red's off the screen. Um, these are the amount of contributions at 10% above the cap. So, a uh, standard person starts contributing to the deficit from age 33 and contributes all the way along. Linear, you've only got a contribution at the end, and red, you've only got a contribution at the very end. And I put the numbers up there. So the contribution by the black part, 30 odd thousand. By the blue part, five and a half thousand. So it's only about a fifth of the amount being contributed. And the red, it's 10. So you can see when people say things to me like, oh, stop fretting, you're being a nuisance, it's too much detail, it doesn't make any material difference. Unfortunately, as a mathematician, I like to ask, what do you mean by material and how much difference does it actually make? Because if you don't tell me how much difference it makes, <clears throat> and it's my legal responsibility to decide whether it's material or not, how can I make that decision? And how can you say it's not material if you haven't done the calculations? Particularly when I go back to the envelope calculations, and I know that half a percent of assets is defined as material, so I can work out whether these things are material. So when you're valuing a pension, what sort of things are you going to think about? What are the benefits that are promised and what will they cost? And what's going to affect that? The salary part, the life expectancy, the retirement age, early retirement, still health retirement, family structures, your marriage rate, the other dependents, death in service, transfer is in, withdrawal. Some of these things are big, some of them are small. Other dependents, yes, uh, a friend of mine died, uh, a couple of years back, his daughter has got severe ME, so although she's adult and not in education, she does get a pension because she's dependent. Um, the other daughter is still in full-time higher education, she gets a pension. However, the majority of people don't do that. That I'd be happy to accept is unlikely to be important. But actually, for all of these things, there is data. It may not be very well kept in its Excel spreadsheet, but it's there. If you have a large pension scheme like BT, British Rail, USS, you can use it. What about the money side of the valuation? <coughs> well, where are you putting the money that's saved each year? What happens with inflation, investments? USS is a fairly broad set of instruments. It has private markets, which is private equity, property, real estate, private credit. Special situations. Special situations are the kinds of things where 
There was a young woman called Agnes Collier. She was in a road traffic accident, so she's quadriplegic. But actually, she's doing pretty well. She's gone off to university, and somebody is paying the costs. Um, the settlement was 23 million. Now, there are various ways in which people will reinsure themselves for that. Interesting enough, you, that is the kind of thing USS might use, as well as buying up um, crematoriums on the grounds that uh, death and taxes are a fairly safe source of income. As our investments going up in smoke is Roger Gray said. And then there are the public markets, equities, credit markets, hedge funds, and government bonds, much beloved of the pensions regulator. There's data. There's statistical models to look at how you do these things. Now I'm going to give you some examples about USS. So let's start with the thing that's the biggest problem in the estimate, which is what returns on investments they're assuming. And I have compared it with returns from other cases. USS assumptions on the returns on investment are spectacularly pessimistic. Now, they're expected to be prudent, which isn't defined in law, but I think most of us could distinguish between prudent and spectacularly pessimistic. So, 1% return. They'd be averaging, I mean, at least 3%, if not 5% above inflation for a very long time. Now, you don't want to, okay, you don't necessarily want to start with that, but you, you want to give it a little bit of credit. So that's one thing that's a bit odd. Another thing that's really rather odd about this, so this is before, now what we call is de-risking. So if there's anybody who studies propaganda and publicity, marketing, if you get most people who want a quick fix and you say, we'll de-risk, they'll go yippee. Okay, you get most academics and they will say, what risk, uh, you know, what else is going on? The world is not one-dimensional. So, sending de-risking sounds wonderful, right? As soon as you don't, as long as you don't ask who's risk and what, right? So, what they mean by de-risking? So, there were two policies. One is going to define contribution. Very, very appealing if you um, are a university treasurer who's had to deal with changes in legislation where you have to show deficit in the estimated deficit in the pension fund on your spreadsheet. So there's this huge lever that you have zero control of. The trustee board can play around with it. So when somebody says, well, actually, if you go to the fine contribution, you will know what contributions you'll have to make, and there won't be a deficit, you think that's wonderful. Actually, the second part of this, that statement is false. But the first part, you will have a fixed amount on your balance sheet, is true, and it's a bit like saying, okay, we have to build in national insurance when we calculate how much it costs. It sounds nice, like certainty. So when people say, okay, DC will make your lives a lot easier, all the vice chancellors accept the one at Warwick. Went, oh, that sounds wonderful. And then you also say, <clears throat> it removes all the risk. It removes all the risk from the employer. It transfers it to, well, not only the employee, but primarily the employee. So instead of having a guaranteed pension, you get your pot of, say, 100,000. You could look up on the internet and look at what, an, what annuity you could buy for 1,000, 100,000. How much money per year can you buy? That is very variable. The amount of pension you get can vary by 20, 30 percent within six months, depending on when you retired. So as far as the employee is concerned, you're not de-risking. You're inducing a lot more uncertainty. They also talk about volatility, which I'm increasingly unconfident people understand. But note the other things: this goes along straight, shoots up, goes along straight. It's a very, very strong belief, right? But also, if uh, you may or may not be able to see very easily, but this blue is on a, one of the lines, 1%. That grey line is above 2%, and that one is below zero. But when we get further into the future, they're closer in. So this is a miraculous form of forecasting, where you get more certain about the future <laughs> for years 11 to 20. 
Okay, that was delayed theoretically. This is what came in after the pension regulator interfered in the propaganda and universities said, oh, we want less risk. So the idea was you put your money into government guilt, which at the moment are giving you negative returns. All right, so they say, give me a thousand pounds for your pension and at the end of the year, I'll give you back 970 pounds and by the way, I'll take a fee on that as well. Well, frankly, at that point, I wouldn't give them a thousand pounds. Why? Why would I bother giving them a thousand pounds? Even if it was only worth a thousand pounds in a year's time, it's worth more than they're going to give me. It, actually, it's not quite as bad as it might have been because Roger Gray was pretty astute at finding reasons why he couldn't actually manage to invest at the, at the moment. Um, and also, in fact, it's a, a range of governments. So when USS is not tied to one particular government. So there is a thing called technical actuarial standards, 300 on pensions, which is some people's annoyance. I almost landed up knowing off my heart. 12C says you must give an indication or description of the volatility of the future funding level and the major causes of volatility. And then it goes down to deviation. Well, it's not quite, but um, an actual profession seems to think it doesn't really matter whether you operate on the on the actual scale or on the log scale. Any of you who are in science might be aware that log and, and natural scales are quite different unless you're talking very small numbers. And if you're going to assume the numbers small enough, again, just make sure you don't have a statistician or a mathematician around looking at whether it is small. Now, what the technical provisions consultation document said was the discount rate proposed is as follows. A flat rate, less than inflation. Then a sudden jump with a decline and then a flat rate. Now, the point is, the actuarial profession claims, and they get taught statistics, which says when you make assumptions, you have to make assumptions that allows the fact that they're not certain, right? There are multiple parameters, sorry, what I would call parameters. There are multiple variable things, right? How did you decide on minus 0.53? How did you decide on 10 years? How did you decide on 2.8? How did you decide on 1.7? All of those things have uncertainty and their uncertainties will be related to one another, right? But the implicit proposals are what we would call a zero variance covariance matrix. And, and of course, you've got to get late, more, less uncertainty for later on. When I said, um, can you please give me the precise description of this? Well, it's too much work. I didn't have time. It, it, it's not possible. We wouldn't do this. Um, we'll just sign this evaluation without looking at it. That is a major driver. Right? It's a major source of uncertainty. If you're a pharmaceutical company and you've got a, take a recent example, a derivative of cannabis that you want to be able to mark for severe epilepsy in children, and you go to NICE and you say, we've done the economic modeling, we will show you costs and benefits in terms of a range of things. But you have to think about there's a cost of the medicine, but equally there's a cost to having a child having lots of seizures. Lots of costs, long-term costs, because it disrupts their education and social development and everything. Lots of costs. But when you go to NICE, you have got to provide them with your software, fully documented and working, with your inputs, so the committee can twiddle them. And so that if, if you say, oh, that doesn't make a material difference, the committee can say, okay, I'll twiddle that number. I can assure you the financial profession wouldn't like that. What's one of the other things going to make a big difference? Mortality. Since around 2000, there's been little or no improvement in mortality rates for life expectancy at all in the UK. John Forster was in Southampton. He's now my boss at uh, Work Statistics. Did the updated statistics for predicting this. There is what's known as a golden cohort, cohort born in the late 20s up to the mid 1930s and when you look at them, post-war certainly, they have got lower death rates than other people. 
but either song. Right? It's not a simple one-way path. And there are a number of reasons why life expectancy is, is not continuing to increase. Um, but if you actually look at what the US is receiving, they're assuming in 2017 that the long-term improvement rate for men will be 1.8% per annum, and for females, 1.6% per annum. Don't ask me to explain it, because it's really convoluted. But in 2014, they were using 1.5%. So they're going the opposite direction from everywhere. Uh, they want to claim that USF population, which is, of course, high socioeconomic class in general, but they say that that group of people is totally different from the top 10% of people in the UK. It's much healthier. I don't know, in September 24, August 2014, the Employers Pension Fund put up frequently asked questions, and one of the questions they posed was, is there a difference, you know, is part of the extra cost of pensions increasing life expectancy? And they said yes. Now, they simply said yes, correct. But they didn't. They said, when the fund was started in 1974, life expectancy at 65 was 6 to 8 years. But in 2014, it's 30 years. So that red line, EPR, is the employer's pension forum, so it should be an F, not an R. And I happened to be sitting at a conference, and Saul Jack had passed this on to me, and I was reading these things, and I looked at that. One of the things I get up to is I act as an expert witness on life expectancy. So that means one of my nerdish qualities is I know quite a lot about life expectancy. I took one look at that and thought, you must be out of your tiny mind. So I looked it up. So there are two, the reason there are two lines there, the lower lines, solid lines, are what are called the period rates. So if you're age 58, we can take all the 58-year-olds in the UK in 2018, see how many of them died, and we can estimate the death rate. But anyway, so if we take all those death rates and say, OK, during this 58 now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a life table taking the death rate for 2018 for 59-year-olds, 60-year-olds, and so on. So those death rates are the current ones. That's your period of life expectancy. As you can see, it was about 12 or so for men, about 16 for women, 74, and it's uh, now up at about 21, um, 18. On the other hand, what you can also do is to say, okay, so for 58 year olds in 2018, the average death rate was 11 per 10,000, but in 2009, it was 13 per 10,000 and so on. So you can actually say, well, let's try to project the death rate forward, which is what John Forster was up to, and then use it. And that's what the cohort is doing. And as you can see, those lines are running above by a couple of years. But neither of them gets remote in there 30 years, in 2014. In actual fact, in 1841, Life expectancy at age 65 was approximately what? Let's have a guess. 1841, you've left at age 65, what's your life expectancy? How long longer would you expect to live? No, no, you've lived to 65, so don't make the mistake of thinking from birth. One year, somebody says? Seven? Seven years? <laughs> it's 10. Right? Back in 1841, if you make it to age 65, your life expectancy, 1841 significantly because we started having the censuses in the, in the UK, life expectancy was about 10 in 1841. And they're trying to tell us that a privileged population in 1974, right? Um, apparently some reason was made to be cynical about people who produced this. And who still does it? Nobody has ever taken responsibility for that statement. Let's think of another thing. You remember I told you about dependents? So we have people, uh, one of the things you've got to estimate is how long will a person live? Because I've got to pay them pension for that length of time. And then when they die, 
if they've still got a spell, then you pay half the page. They start to spill diseases then, you don't pay. Right, so that's where you get what is known as the proportion marry. It doesn't actually mean the proportion marry, it means the pro proportion who have a surviving spouse or other dependents, but as I say, other dependents fairly rare, when they die. The rape data, this was kindly put up by Sheffield, the rape data is the actual observed results for USS of the number of female pensioners who left dependents. So at age 55, you know, in the, in the 50s, if a woman dies, there's about 70% chance that she will leave a surviving spouse who has to have a pension. By the time, unsurprisingly, you get up to here, it's very unlikely, not because they weren't necessarily married, but it's very unlikely that a man will um, outlive his, his wife to get up to that end. Now, that great dotted line was the 2014 assumption put into the valuation. It's, it's a best thing. Okay. Well, the claim yeah. was, the principle was that these, there must be no prudence in these assumptions, you must get the best fit, and that is what is put in as the best fit. Now, I think even as a ruler, nobody would attempt to call that best fit. And I've been told it doesn't matter, but actually I can look at the average discrepancy of that 12%, and I can turn that into numbers of money, that relates back to the standards of what is material. Yeah? I think I'm a little bit stuck. No, no, you're not. Sorry, I'm good. If you could go back one slide. Yep. So you're saying um, that not only um, is the, you know, the, what you described as the good in front of the and not the red line, mm -hmm. um, and that is a problem because, of course, it projects a higher risk. So if people mm. get older, of course they need more money. And are you saying it is such because um, it is so ludicrous because of the starting point of that line? It, it, I don't know where it came from. I have my suspicions. It was clear from following it up it came from within USS. I don't think, I, I don't think a lawyer, given the evidence, would, or a serious court. It came from within that. I don't think it was ever a real number. I think those numbers were put out to scare people. It's like talking about de risk. They're pure injunction. Nobody who really worked in pensions on life expectancy should have come up with anything like that. That was done to scare. It gives you a exaggeration. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah, it was, it was, it was I mean, I, probably, I should give the actuaries credit and say it probably didn't come from the actuaries. It probably came from somebody who just wanted to exaggerate and was overconfident in getting away with it. The thing about having been a medical scientist for many years is you just get very used to arrogant people telling you blatant lies and being surprised when you notice. Um, so with this one, yeah, wildly out. Anybody want to tell how you got that line? That's what happens for men. Uh, why should we assume there's any difference between men and women? So, 2014, they just applied the rate for men. So that will have exaggerated the liabilities in 2014. And, and so, you know, somebody was very proud of the new assumptions. The actuarial profession has had on their syllabus, we teach them, generalised linear models since before the new millennium. It is trivial. I did it. They accidentally gave you the data. In printed on the sheet. And I put that in and ran the analysis within 20 minutes. Right? It's trivial. Um, but, you know, that's what, they got, that, that's what they get taught to do, it's not what they practice. What about retirement rates? Now, when you retire, it's quite important, particularly if you get enhanced pensions and it affects how much money is coming into the scheme and when. Now, this is uh, the rate at which people have been retiring. Final salary previously and the new scheme. And you can see that the older members, people who have been members for longer, speak of retirement at 60, so you've got a pretty good deal there. 
Grant Thompson, and then you get another figure from Tarn and the Dolphin and so on. And then effectively, the, the other two colours, green and purple, are giving you information on what's happening. So you can see the retirement age is probably moving up. I haven't given you numbers. This might not be very certain, but numbers can be done. However, 2017, these are the retirement tables. 30%, 10, 15, 15, 20. Do you think it's just possible they're still using the table to have turned computers? Well, I was mentoring a colleague who was teaching the official actuarial course, CT5, on valuing a pension fund. Uh, it did make quite a lot of reference to tables. It didn't seem to make very much reference to computers. And the main requirement was to learn notation which is stuck in the 19th century. I mean, it's, it's the most un unbelievably clumsy notation. We have got notation that is far more efficient. But no, no, as long as you can memorize a notation and look something up in the table. But those figures, now notice, doesn't it show men and women? So why are we separating men and women for proportions married and not separating them when it comes to the retirement rate? Well, you see, of course, Women tend to retire a bit earlier, so that will tend to increase your estimated liability. So if we give every... And, of course, women have slightly lower salaries. So if you put the two things together, it's another way of just bumping up your liabilities quite nicely. So, you know, the various things, right? Why are you getting those curves? Why are you getting those fits? Why are you having inconsistency in how you treat men and women? Why are they combined sometimes and not other times? I also challenge them because there's a standard assumption about the difference in age between staff because that affects your life expectancy. And I said that standard assumption may be all very well in general, but it's almost certainly wrong in USF. And that one will genuinely increase your estimated liabilities, and I was right on that. I did not only really point out things that would reduce the liability. The other thing that's funny is they make no attempt to look at the different in this different types of retirement. <coughs> but there's loads of changes in what's happening, and there's perfectly straightforward ways of modelling it. So the pensions regulator is very keen on shifting everybody to defined contribution. In Canada, the public sector said, "Hmm, maybe we should get somebody to do some serious looking into this." And so a couple of people did, and they looked at what happens, and they said, we asked what we're trying to achieve through converting large public sector pension plans from DB to DC, and then we look at whether these goals would be achieved, not just for the public sector employers, but for everybody who would be affected, either directly or indirectly. If you're a private company, when you change your pensions, fine, off your books. If you've got any kind of concept of society and a collective society, you might think about wider implications. And if you're public sector, you jolly well ought to. And the paper concludes, after examining the literature and the experience of other jurisdictions, modelling what the ramifications would be in converting a large Canadian DB plan to DC, we found that none of the stakeholders, including taxpayers, would be better off. The other thing they said, I can't to put the detail up here, no, those are the rest of them. The other thing they pointed out is you wouldn't even get the liabilities off your books. And you've got the backdated liabilities. So all the universities who thought going over to DC would mean they could remove this deficit from their books. Bad luck. Gone. Leave it on that. So that's some of the issues, some of the reasons why I'm pretty concerned. There are points that were picked up by the Joint Expert Panel's first report, which have not been paid attention to. No. You have to... 
you have to say, and I've said this repeatedly, please, first of all, tell me what risks you're considering and what you're trying to achieve. It's, it's, it's the same sort of spirit as, um, uh, as that, you know, what's happening. What you want to do, your basic idea, obviously, is to try to have a, a range of things. It's not all your eggs in one basket. It's a reasonably sensible thing to do. What has happened, unfortunately, is that because, although it's not true now, because for a very long time, gilts, which are government index linked securities, because they didn't vary much for a very long time, there's a folk belief that they don't vary. And so the, the main definition of de-risking is saying um, we don't want too much variation. And we think they don't vary, so we're going to use them. In fact, they do vary. They do, they vary more than bonds. The FTSE 100, and Saul Jack has looked at that, I think he put it on his webpage. Um, you could, there, there's another ver version they use, which is trying to have liability linked investments. So, for example, if you're investing in infrastructure, which may be quite a sensible thing to do anyway, to benefit the country, if you're investing in infrastructure, it's quite likely that those returns will be broadly similar to the general growth in the country, and therefore will generally match what you're trying to do with your pension. Whereas if you're investing in oil or gold, they're going to go up and down. So the main idea is to try to have a breadth. And the other big difference, which is a, a problem that's come about through the war between accountants and actuaries, is that they're treating the valuation of actual numbers. What you should actually be doing is not valuing the budget, like saying, this is the money we've got, these are the cash flows into the future. Is it broadly all right? But what you've got this thing is, is a sort of exercise of could we sell everything today, give the money to an insurance company, and would they be happy? Well, they'd be very happy, as the Canadian thing points out. They were still 40% of it. So that's why self sufficiency estimates are so expensive, because they're putting about 40% of it into. Thing. Obviously, from a government point of view, it might be de-risking because they're taking the money out of the pension funds into their own use and giving them less than inflation back. But you should always say, how many possible risks and benefits, who are the stakeholders, how do they interact? That's actually why I mentioned the Declaration of Professional Ethics, which has got me into trouble, got me into trouble with USS, because it says you must consider all the different groups. You don't just focus on one outcome, one person. Who benefits short-term and long-term from the I, I have not had the energy to really kind of work out some motivation because I've had I have put a lot of time into trying to find out what's going on. I think one thing that's happened is that there was a a naive belief. Um, not shared by Baroness Ross often, but a naive belief within the pension regulator that DC solved all their problems. They still think that because they see their role as protecting the pension protection fund. And of course, the best way to protect the pension protection fund is to make sure nobody has a pension. <laughs> right? DC means you've got no pension fund, so you protect the pension fund. And I wish I was joking, but from some of the dialogues we've had, they're fixated on protecting the pension fund, the protection fund, not protecting pension. And those are two totally different things. Um, Opperman, when he was Minister for Pensions, under the Minister for Pensions, said at the Select Committee he'd never realised that you had to buy annuities. He was just focused on people having a pension fund. Had no idea. So the other report that this says um, is that in the United States, that well-known socialist egalitarian place, a number of the states have converted back from DC to DB because DC gave their employees such a poor return. Uh, the people who could benefit, if you if you turned USS commercial, obviously, would be the executive and the, some of the directors. The other people that would benefit would be other insurers and so on if you sold products that people had to pay for. If you move a lot more into DC, then again, you're, you're sort of moving into the realm of getting more fees out of people. Um, uh, you can 
all, all sorts of variations of cynicism. Um, it would depend who had access to what material, what you could find out. But you know, the, the point, you know, the point of quoting this is that is this conclusion, and that you know, pretty thorough bit of research. Right? You're just not benefiting anyone. You, in a public sector, in a private sector, if you look at a narrow-minded view of things, then yes, you've moved from ever having to worry about deficit. <laughs> you're saying, putting well, 15% end of story, end of responsibility. And one thing the vice chancellors have realised is that, of course, you have to recruit people, and that some of those people might look at the pension as part of the package. And that's why a lot of VCs have changed their minds. They're dithering, but not the strikes will probably get them thinking quite hard. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 excuse my ignorance, but um, the, with DC, when, when you say, I don't know if that's the word you use, but um, you said something like uh, DC doesn't guarantee that the pension is going to happen. Is that because what the retired person gets when they retire depends on how well the investment went? Um, will go. Will it's go not just and, went. And, um, uh, can end up with nothing if the pension fund. I have a just look at something. Um, the, the main problem is is this. Um, what you get with the defined contribution is you get that lump sum. So you would get, say, that six hundred thousand or four hundred thousand. You get it, and then you go out and you have to buy, and then, well, you don't have to. If you go out and buy an annuity. Effectively, you're buying an income which an insurance company is giving you, and they're going to want to make a profit. And also, there's only you, so they're going to put in a long life expectancy estimate because that will increase their profit. So over the years, how much would ten thousand pounds buy you as a 65 year old male? And it used to buy you 15 pounds a year. And it might now buy you five. And if you, if you see these kinds of jumps, that's what I meant. If you retire there versus there, you go, you go out and buy it. And you're, and you're paying it for profit. That's why there's a discussion of the com collector's defined contribution, because that's coming back to the collective strength of averaging over all kinds of risks. Well, you can you can put it in the bank or invest it yourself, yeah. <coughs> right? Which, which people in this room is plausible. If you're thinking at a country level, right? Not many people, you know, Australia is ahead of us on this Q super, and they did this, assuming that people could go and look at the market for annuities. Now, frankly, a lot of my colleagues are not happy doing that let alone anybody who doesn't have that degree of familiarity with things. What happens if you, if you treat a market in annuities like a market stalled in a village with different people selling their eggs? Well, basically, you rip people off big time. There's always going to be unscrupulous people out there. So the pension regulator keeps talking about scams. And you go, yeah, of course. Sorry, there's a question behind you. Um, so the trustee obviously it has to look after the interests of the scheme of the public, but, it, but presumably its main responsibility is to act in the interest of its members, is it not? Um, and, and therefore, what, what, is, what, what is the actual reason for all these kind of, sort of not looking at the evidence properly and sort of saying, oh, well, you know, we're, we're going to go ahead anyway, um, which don't seem to be in the interest of its members? So, directors have a number of duties, one of which is to promote the success of the company. Not much discussion of what you mean by the success of the company. It is not apparent to me from anything that's in the public domain that uh, the trustee is particularly concerned about members' pensions. It's very concerned about what the pension regulator thinks. It's very concerned about estimated deficits. It's very concerned about its reputation. Does it 
Oh, it has a response to yes. I mean, if you look at the pension regulator's website, and it's decided to change it, thanks to questions some people have asked, if you look at the pension director's website, and indeed the um, government website about directors, yes, they have a responsibility to all the members and stakeholders. But they may not choose to listen to it. Or may not interpret it in the same way that we do. Um, so you were... So um, there's lots of fun and games when you play with lawyers, and I played with lawyers a lot. Um, so and the, the the USS has a a love for talking about openness and transparency. Um, and I mean a lot of talking about openness and transparency. Transparency. They don't like it. Their whistleblowing policy was marked restrictive business sensitive. <laughs> they did admit that that was a little bit silly. Um, basically, according to the USS, everything, including the dates of meetings, the time of meetings, who's attended the meeting, is confidential and nobody's allowed to know. They, they mark everything confidential, which is excessive. So, um, you can look at what David Eastwood said, see whether you believe it. And the lawyers will have fun. So, UCU is UCU is funding. So, so the, the, the big problem is, if you look at the whistleblower, um, the APGG on whistleblowing, uh, you, you'll find that in their report, um, the, the first report, um, which is, they make it very clear that um, I think it's somewhere in here. It says something that the, the, you know it doesn't work for MPs. And M what MPs have met the frustration of regulators who see their role as putting obstacles in the way of people trying to do the right thing. And, and that's how I would describe the regulators in the financial sector. They see their primary role as to make life difficult for anybody who attempts to blow a whistle. And the only recourse at the moment, and again this, this, um, this report pointed out, so I'm just merely repeating the report. Um, what they say at the moment is the legislation is not fit for purpose. The only route you've got is an employment tribunal, which cannot address the actual issues. And of course, USS has to date employed five, not five solicitors, five firms of solicitors to try to silence them. Five firms. And you can ask them how much they've spent. I so say UCU is backing me because I've got to go to the employment function route. That is the route. Uh, and that will, you know, as long as the Financial Reporting Council and the Pensions Regulator refuse to act, there is no way of investigating them. So UCU is supporting me on that route. Um, the claim was submitted. It might take 25 days on average before the employment tribunal will get round to sending it on. I mean, literally, all they just have to do is forward the email. But they, they, they will say, oh, it could take an average 25 days to forward the email. And then USS has 28 days to respond. And then we might get an initial hearing. Ah. And the whole thing, you know, the regulations over a year failed to respond to me. It's a waiting game. It's a power game. You haven't got enough money to play with us. And you're going to be intimidated. Because how many people like the prospect of going into court and being cross-examined. What's happened? I like it. I've I've talked to lots of judges, you know, I'm writing a primary on statistics for judges. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt, go for it. But the game in general with whistleblowers is they won't want to do that. Is there a question somewhere there? Yeah? Um, yeah, thank you very much. It's very educational. I was curious to know what is going on with relations between the USS and the UK. So am I. Okay. <laughs> and one of the problems, of course, the UK is a very mixed 
bag. Um, and if you look at USS Priest, you get the sort of bit of the trial run. Alistair Jarvis was the sidekick of um, Eastwood. Janet Fear, who was the previous chair, got her dame, her honours via Eastwood, I think. I think that's through the current chair. So you, you've got collections of different sets of people with different sets of priorities. Um, I know that I know the university. You know some of the universities, but all the universities are really worried about the strike. Um, it's not just the immediate effect; it's the effect on international, you know, India, China. Very bad effect on on recruitment to master's courses and so on. Last time round, likely to do the same now. Probably even worse for China, who clearly don't like people uh, with industrial action. And completely unnecessary. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, a few years ago, there was um, a lot of um, complaints about the removal of fund salary schemes. Um, I'm sorry if you covered this in five minutes. But it's okay. No. Um, as, as a younger person, it always seems to me that the final salary schemes are absolutely awful because it basically means that um, with every cent of your employer coming along for the last minute, it basically gets ahead of them. You know, jack up your salary. And everyone else will just be in place for this. And therefore, like, predominantly, yeah. yeah, I did. Uh, yeah, I, I did touch on that. You're right. What What was odd was. I, no, no. I, I. Well, as I looked through it, I mean, basically, I don't know if I said it this time, but you know, when I've talked about it, I've said I think the career revalued scheme is much fairer, right? But the origins of the final salary scheme were in a period when people tend to have an increase in salary that then levels. And also, when I was doing stuff in my dad's office as a teenager, the final salary schemes tended to be averaged over the last five or ten years of annual pension of the monuments. So that you had a damp USS, which I didn't realize until I started looking, you know, got into the detail. USS had an excessively generous, find out the largest salary over the last three years and give you that. So it wasn't even average, it was the largest. So it was disastrous from that point of view. Well, I mean, surely, however it's done, it's still always going to be unfair. The idea that actually you're not taking average of what you're, you're actually earning. It 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 would, would have been it time. would have been ge slightly generous in the old days, but actually most people really did level. But yes, I would agree that I think the career revalue is a is a sensible one. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I guess the question that's raised for me in seeing the different uh, examples you're showing us. Uh, of uh, the USS presenting certain charts or data, and then you know uh, you pointing out without much difficulty what's the problem with it. I, I'm trying to understand then why, say, other people on the trustee board or UUK weren't saying those things. How much? How many people lack mathematical well, okay, ability? Okay. So, the, uh, so the chair who laughed and said, "Well, I suppose you know the joint expert panel. I suppose I think they're experts." Well, he's obviously an expert because he's an ex-historian. Uh, one of the other UCU reps is well, a historian. Um, one of the others was in IT. He's probably one of the most numerous. Um, Muscatelli is an economist. I honestly, I honestly don't know. Um, who knows what pressure or motivation they have? It's not difficult. But then the whole part of the problem is the whole. All professions will tend to close in on themselves if you attack them. So you think you're old enough to remember the Bristol Royal Infirmary or Sally Clark, where the, the Lord Chancellor said it's far too expensive to have statistical evidence and so on. And the actuarial profession is in that space, you know, as Adam Smith said, all professions are conspiracy against the laity. Uh, the UK is very badly behind. Very badly behind. Um, you know, I had a, a, one of my fourth year students from Denmark was saying that in, in Denmark and in Europe, if you want to become an actuary, you've got to have a first class degree in maths. In this country, you don't even have to have a maths degree to become an actuary, right? That tells you what the problem is. They're all running scared. Not all, sorry. There are some very good problems. A lot of them are running scared. Well, if I could push that further, because I could see how sort of within the circle, the closing ranks when mm. being threatened. But then what about, say, the BC side, or in one sense, seemingly outside that circle? Have they not? A lot of them are, the they do now, yeah. but a lot of them are, are remarkably enumerated right. and not willing to admit it. Right. Okay. Right? So obviously Stuart Cross, our BC at Warwick, has been standing up and making comments and so on. 
But of course, if you've got a little bit of uh, now, you might work out he might have written one of those blocks. <laughs> right? He obviously puts his name to me. Um, but he just had the gut instinct to say no. This doesn't make sense. I am actually this afternoon going to the Isaac Newton Institute <clears throat> to talk to people at the Newton Gateway about a meeting um, about the actuarial profession and their standards compared with the medicines. Uh, and I want to have a, a, a meeting that says, look, your regulation isn't worth the paper it's written on. I mean, I know John King has already said that. You've got to completely rethink this before your profession's wiped down. And if I have to wipe out your profession, Um, since we are in Cambridge, and maybe it's an unfair question and feel free not to answer, but how, what's your view on Trinity College putting out those Trin I, I think it was, I think it was probably a bunch of silly dons overreacting, or more likely one or two administrators overreacting. However, they're in the position where they can say, you know what, this is a nuisance, we don't need to play. Um, there may be one or two other colleges who might be near that position, but not many. Um, I, I think they were buying, what it, you know, as I say, what had been sold to the other VCs, which is you don't want the hassle every year of trying to do your budgeting and planning with an unknown contribution coming up and an unknown massive notional deficit. Um, so, you know, at one level, I, I can sympathise with. They also, I mean, they also stupidly panicked about being the last man standing and having to sell things to, to bail out the fund. It's just vanishingly improbable. But it was, it was, it's a nice example of how you could panic people into doing things. And if you haven't got enough people to say, let's put this all out and think of all the consequences, then, you know, the, the regulator still, the pension regulator still says it's an evidence-based regulator. But according, you know, and accor therefore, according to them, they've accused Price Waterhouse Cooper and EY Parthenon of complete incompetence. But for some reason, they haven't put in a professional incompetence complaint. You know, we've had, there have been about eight or ten excellent reports saying the covenant of the university is strong. And the regulators are saying you're going to have to, you know, fill in the hole in the deficit in seven years because you might not be a rep. You know, I think, well, the university we're in has been around a little longer than seven years. Just one, one follow-up question again. It, uh, to what degree do you think you've described the regulations not being worth the paper they're written on in the current state of things? Do you, do you think that on the VC side, is there a level of trust that they think, well, if USF is saying these things, they're the actual, or, or do well, they all... Well, the you know, I mean, I had this when I started asking questions. I said, why don't you trust the profession? To which my answer was, look, the default position is, you assume you know what they're doing until something flags. And then you ask, if you get a sensible answer, like, oh, that was stupid of me. I mean, hey, I've made plenty of mistakes in my time, you know. Um, I was just reading an email this morning, <laughs> both myself and another colleague managed to multiply something incorrectly. Uh, but there's a big difference between saying, sorry, that was stupid of me, and, and refusing information, refusing and refusing. I've, I've been on two committee papers about detecting fraud. And one of the flags is people refusing to answer your question. Right? And I said this, you know, the more you refuse to provide me with simple answers to simple questions, all you're doing is increasing my levels of suspicion. And I think, that, I think the VCs have begun to wonder. But initially, you know, you've employed somebody to do that job. You can't do everything. So that's, you know, I do think there are, you know, I can't tell you exactly why, but I do think you'll find the VCs have a very different range of views now from three years ago. Thanks very much for coming.